What's it like to live as a homeless person for 24 hours in Dallas, Texas? Let's talk about it in this episode of Book Fun TV with Susie Jennings. Patricia Durgan with Book Fun TV, where we interview your favorite authors. Today, I'm with Susie Jennings, the founder and director of Operation Care International. Her first book, 31 Days of Mountaintop Miracles, just released last December. We're going to talk about that in just a little bit. But first, let's just say hey. Hi, Susie. Thanks for joining me. Hi, Patricia. I understand that you have not, from a, a small nucleus, of serving a few people, homeless people, under a bridge in Dallas, Texas, has grown with the Lord's direction and care into an international ministry where you're helping people both in Dallas, still helping them, and also helping impoverished children in nine countries. Yes. <laughs> That's a blessing. 24,000 children. 24,000 children. It's so, so amazing. Tell us a little bit about your background, how you got started with this. You, you were a nurse. Yes. It really started in my mother's um, kitchen, this ministry. <laughs> the best ones start in the kitchen. Mother's kitchen, that's how it all started. When I was in the Philippines, I was when I was a little girl, my mother used to feed the homeless in, in her kitchen. And I'm one of nine children. So we really were not rich at all. And then the homeless will come to our home and my mother will feed them and give them jobs. And there was a time that the homeless came and ate in our kitchen. And I really did not like that at all. I could not stand it because I felt like they ate my food. They occupied my space. Uh -huh. So I was a little arrogant little girl. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And until... When I came to America as a nurse, I was hired in the Philippines by Baylor Hospital in Dallas, Texas. And I came in America in 1982. And then I met my uh, late husband at First Baptist Dallas in an evening service. Then uh, we got married after 13 months of dating. And then after that, he was uh, uh, diagnosed three years after we were married. He was diagnosed with a chemical imbalance called serotonin deficiency, and that caused severe depression. So on March 9, 1993, he left our home, and he disappeared for 30 days, and we discovered him after 30 days because his car was found in Atoka, Oklahoma, and we live in Texas. We live in Mesquite, which is near Dallas, and his car was found by a farmer in Atoka, Oklahoma, in the hills of Atoka. And David had been there for 30 days. It was March 9 when he left. It was April 8 when we went to Atoka and tried to locate him. And uh, we found him on that day. But David had been dead for 30 days. So he was a decomposing corpse when we found his body. And that was the saddest moment when... When the police said uh, he found a body, anyway, I felt like the whole world came to my shoulder. And then he took us to the body, but I could not get near David because there was a, a, a little creek that separated me from him. The Lord did it that way because David had been dead for 30 days, so he was already like a skeleton on his neck, and his body was decomposing. And... Uh, and then my reaction was I was very mad at David, but not at God. But I was mad at David that he left me. Uh, we didn't have any children. And I was really mad because we were supposed to grow old together. And then he, he left me. And, and then my pastor took me on the hills, on the top of the hills, on the way to the car. And on the top of the hills, I screamed at the top of my voice. And I asked God, Lord, give me strength. With my arms raised, I just asked God for strength. So I did it twice, and immediately 
uh, I have this electric voltage that hit my toes, and then it traveled from my toes up to my legs, and then it came out of my mouth. And immediately, uh, I felt this immense peace in my heart, like, and then somebody, I felt like somebody lifted me, like two people lifted me in my arm, and then I started walking to the car, and I felt like I was walking one foot uh, above the gravel ground, okay. and there was so much peace. So I think the one that came out from me were all spirit of anxiety, fear, anger, uh, resentments towards David, not knowing what will happen, anxiety. And so the Lord took it away. And then we buried David the day before Easter. And then on Easter Sunday, he was supposed to sing in our church. And the title of his song was Heaven. Mm -hmm. And But we believe he was singing it with the Lord because David was saved. He was, uh, he was saved when he was a little boy. He accepted Jesus in his heart as Lord and Savior. But it was an illness, a chemical imbalance that uh, caused him to kill himself. So mm -hmm. it was an illness that killed him. And then three days later, I had a birthday. And it was a very sad birthday. We buried him on April 10th. Birth, my birthday was April 13. It was a very sad birthday. And then three months later, I had a car accident, so I could not walk. So I became disabled. And then two months after that, I started walking. And then I was baking a cake in our kitchen. Then 30 feet from me, I saw in, our, in my fence, I saw policemen in the other side of the fence going back and forth. So I went outside and asked the police. I said, sir, what's going on with my neighbor? And he said, your neighbor committed suicide. See, David committed suicide in the hills of Atoka, Oklahoma. And then my neighbor shot himself just like what David did. Mm -hmm. And they were five months apart mm -hmm. when this happened. And that's when I got mad at God. I told God, why, why, why? And then I questioned him. And this happened on September 7, 1993. David died on March 9, 1993. We discovered him April 8, 1993. And then September 7, that's when uh, my neighbor killed himself. And then I questioned God. I was very mad at God. And then on that night, I had a dream. He gave me a dream. And in the dream, he gave me a vision. I was knocking at my neighbor's doors. I was telling them about Jesus. So the next day, I woke up, and I decided to choose joy instead of sorrow. Because when David was missing, I would read Psalms chapter by chapter every single night for 30 days. And there was a verse in Psalms 30, verse 5, that said, Weeping may endure for a night, joy comes in the morning. So I choose joy instead of sorrow because, you know, life is full of choices. Yes, so I decided yes. I'm going to choose joy. So I asked God the next morning, September 8th, I woke up, knelt at the foot of my bed, and then raised my hand, and then I said, Lord, what can I do for you? This is what I tell the people. Do not ask God what can you do for him. <laughs> you are not prepared. <laughs> going to take you out of your comfort zone that you don't even want to go. Yes. So that was September and then October at church at 12 noon, leaving the church with my widowed mother. We were passing by a Canton Bridge in downtown Dallas while driving exactly 12 noon. I heard this voice. It said, look at your left side. The voice was in my heart, very loud. It said, look at your left side. So I look at the left side, and then I saw about 100 men and women under the bridge living in a cardboard box as their homes and trash bags as windows, and that was October, so it was a little cooler. And then the boy said, you are going to go there in person. And then my response was, I said, no, not me. I'm not going. Those are crazy homeless people. They are lunatics. They are violent. They're going to kill me. And I could not stand homeless people. They smell so bad. And I remember when I was growing up, they would come to our homes and they would be just drooling and hair and so dirty. Uh -huh. Then there was a homeless woman when I was 10 years old in the Philippines. I was in the marketplace that she slapped me with no provocation. So that added for my dislike to homeless people. Mm -hmm. And then for God to call me to go under the bridge to help the homeless people 
I could not stand it. So my response was, I said, no, not me. I'm not going. I said, those are, I, I'm not going. Those are crazy people and they are smelly. And I'm so clean. I'm, I'm a nurse. And then the voice said, you were the one who asked me, what can you do for me? Right there, I was convicted in my spirit. I said, Lord, forgive me. What can I bring to these people? They are needy people. And then the voice said, blankets. And that's the start. The next day, I went to Baylor Hospital. I called the store. How much is a blanket? They said $5. So I asked all doctors and nurses for $5. And I asked them, I said, could you please give me $5? I wanted to buy a blanket for the homeless. It's going to be Thanksgiving. It's going to be cold under the bridge. So people started giving me $5. And then a Sunday before Thanksgiving, we went under that same bridge and we brought 100 blankets. And you could see the people running towards us when they saw us bringing blankets under our armpit. And they were running. They were so happy to see us because we have gifts. And then we shared Jesus one-on-one. -on -one. And you could picture the whole bridge covered with people two by two. You know, one with a blanket sharing Jesus and one homeless. You could see it in different parts of that bridge it was a beautiful sight and then we went back on december of 93 a sunday before christmas with an evangelist who stood on the pickup truck who preached jesus see we don't give away the gifts immediately we share jesus first and pray with them and then we give them the gift because we believe the change starts from the heart so you need to deal with the heart it's a heart issue so we need to let them know that Jesus cares for them and we care for them. That's why we came to give them that gift. And so that was the start of a blanket ministry. And the homeless people started calling me the blanket lady. And that was the beginning of a ministry that became so huge because God gave us another vision. Me and my uh, chairman of the board had a vision that during Christmas time, one day, at least for one day, the homeless don't have to think about where they get their food. We could pamper them for a day in Jesus' birthday celebration. So we said we will have a birthday party for Jesus where the guests of honor are the homeless and the poor children. And, and how did you get from all of these wonderful ministry opportunities around the world and locally at home to writing a book? Well, uh, because I had so many miracles that happened from the time this all started, and it's called 31 Days of Mountaintop Miracles, and the Lord just put in my heart, uh, actually the book, uh, I started writing it in 2010, but I did not finish it. So last year in August, last week of August, the Lord put in my heart that I need to finish the remaining 16 chapters. Plus, it was I was also encouraged by Roaring Lambs Ministry because they honored me in November of 2014 as the Hall of Fame honoree. Mm -hmm. So they said, Susie, why don't you write a book? Because their honorees are incredible. The honorees are like uh, like Oliver North, uh, Mary Kay, uh, Czech Play owner. I mean, these are big people and they ask me and they will honor me and they said, why don't you write a book? Because all these people have books. So the Lord put in my heart, and then they, with their encouragement, so I wrote a book, and it was another miracle, because from the time the Lord spoke in the last week of August, I signed a contract on September 1st. In October 15, I had the book in my hand. It took 45 days. Uh, that is not signing. normal. No, from the signing of the contract to the book right in my hand, delivered from the printing press oh. with a thousand books. Uh, that was given away in November to the Roaring Lambs during when they honored me as the Hall of Fame. The books, I had a thousand books because there were a thousand people. So that was another miracle. So the book is full of 31 days of, it's called 31 Days of Mountaintop Miracles. And the website address is? Website is opcare.org, O-P-C-A-R-E.org. And also they need to get my book because all these stories, my testimony about my husband and this amazing event all over the world is in the book. And they could choose the best story they want because there are 31 miracles that are just truly incredible. It will touch your heart. And 
and people actually from your book uh, uh, book club they were uh, making uh, I think um, a book review and one said caution he said caution you need lots of Kleenex <laughs> you read the book and it's an easy read because it's only like two three pages a chapter okay so it's a very easy read it's amazing book so I highly recommend give it away as a gift instead of giving clothing uh -huh. a book because my goal for the book is that people will become closer to the Lord and they will come to know Jesus and all the proceeds go to the homeless it doesn't go to me it all goes to the ministry so three things by the way about unconditional obedience because the book is about unconditional obedience three things that God did in my life that I obeyed unconditionally number one he told me to go under the bridge and help the homeless which I did not like but I came full circle in that bridge that bridge became my road to Damascus experience where I heard the voice of God yes. that was number one number two he told me in November in November 2000 Seven, that I will live in the streets of Dallas and become homeless. So I did. I lived for a day, uh, 24 hours. I slept among 100 homeless men and women next to a woman high in cocaine. That was the scariest uh, part of that deal. I never slept a wink. I was so scared of her, but she was so high in drugs that I was scared she would burn my hair. I had a wig. And then I was scared she would stab me so I have to put my backpack behind my back because uh, my back is next to her. Uh -huh. And that was the scariest time. But it opened my eyes to the plight of the homeless every day. What happened to those that became homeless, not their choice to become homeless. It was very scary. So it made me empathize more to the plight of the homeless. So God opened my eyes. So that was the second thing that God told me, and that was uncomfortable for me. That was not my comfort zone. Mm -hmm. Number three, in 2010, God spoke in my heart. He said, you're going to leave your six-figure income as a nurse and become a missionary with nothing. And I left my job without looking back. And look where God is taking me all over the world. I was in Israel twice last year in four months. Two times. Wow. And that was just a dream before to even go to Israel. Now we are going to build a school. So when the school is up, we're going to go back and do an open, you know, like a, a cutting of the ribbon. And that would be just another dream. Like, oh my gosh. Look what God is doing if you obey unconditionally. So the book is all about unconditional obedience. And if God could change my hardened heart towards the homeless, people I didn't like, and the ministry I didn't want, he could change yours or anybody else. And then the Bible said, Proverbs 19:17, He who is kind to the poor lends to the Lord. Could you imagine lending to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? It is so incredible. And then after 2020, we could ask Jesus, Lord, you need to come now because the world is evangelized in one day. It's time for you to come and get us out of here. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Uh, do you have a, before we close down, uh, do you have a parting thought or a story you'd like to share with us? Oh, in regards to stories, I have so many stories. This one. I have so many stories uh, that... Um, well, anyway, um, I would like to tell a story about how this woman, uh, she was homeless, and she had three children, and she had a two-year-old girl, and then a seven-year-old boy, and then a nine-year-old boy. So every night, she would tie her children to her waistline. She, would, she lived under the bridge, and then she would tie them so nobody could snatch them out from her. It was cold. Then she came to our party, in December party, but she did not see me. So she called me on a Sunday, because the party was Saturday. She called me on a Sunday, and she was begging if we could send her home to New York, to her family. And I said, okay, tell me your story. So she told me her story about uh, having her children under the bridge with her. And then I said, how about the food? She said, oh, I would steal from Tom Thumb Grocery. She would steal from them so she could feed her family. And I said, what happened to you? She said, well, I had a home before, but my husband kicked us out because he had another woman with him. 
So I said, how about uh, money? And he said, well, in the morning, I would sell myself. She became a prostitute with her two-year-old girl. And that broke my heart. I cried. I wept. And I said, I'm going to help you. We're going to help you. Operation Care is going to help you. So we called her mother-in-law in New York. And then the mother-in-law, when she answered the phone, she was screaming and so happy that we called. I said, we're going to return, send your uh, daughter-in-law and your grandchildren to you before Christmas. So that happened three days after our event. And we gave her a gift. Uh, each one had received a gift. And then we gave her pocket money of $200. And we paid $800 for the fare. And then she arrived in New York. And then uh, I followed up. And I was told by the mother-in-law that uh, two days after the children arrived, they were in school. And then they're now in an apartment in New York. So it's a changed life. Yeah. And we have some that we reunited that now have jobs also. So that, even just for the sake of one, I will do the work over and over, hard work, hard work. But it's such a joy because I know we are investing for eternity. That's right. This is about a business, God's business. Because you keep on giving goods or stuff like that. But if you're not telling them about Jesus, and then if you're not connecting them to churches, then nobody could follow up. So mm -hmm. we try to do that. With, uh, by partnering with other ministries that could help us. So a changed life, changing lives, changing the world one life at a time. Mm -hmm. that's, what we, what, that's what we're doing. And we're looking forward for 2020. So I hope, and through this, that churches will come on board. We're going to teach them how to do this. And we'll wait for 2020. We will all celebrate Jesus' birthday all over the world, same day, same time. And we're calling for evangelists to prepare and uh, prepare for that big event and do an evangelistic crusade, the biggest crusades they could do, because that's what Jesus wants. Crusades and people will be saved, millions will come to know Christ. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. It's very exciting, very wonderful to hear all these great stories and he is <coughs> excuse me, seeing the total obedience, unconditional obedience, changes our lives and makes us have it gives us opportunities to go out and affect other people's lives for Christ. Unconditional obedience produces joy. It blesses us, it blesses Jesus, which is J. It blesses others, which is O. It blesses you, which is you. Yes. So unconditional obedience produces J O Y. Thank you so much for joining me today. I so appreciate it, Susie. Thank you. Such a joy to tell people about Jesus. And uh, what a miracle God, I uh, mean, miraculous God that produces miracles over and over if you obey unconditionally. So first, my, my, my number one uh, desire is that people will become closer to the Lord through reading my book, 31 Days of Mountaintop. Miracles. So go and get it from your local bookstore. Uh, amen. And we'll sign off with that. Thanks very much for joining us today. And uh, we'll see you in the next episode of Book Fun TV.